Our next speaker is certainly no stranger to us. Brother Bruce Stulting was born and raised in Carnes City, Texas. He graduated from Southwest School of Bible Studies in 1989. I remember those two years quite well. I can't forget. I've been in therapy ever since. You needed to be in therapy before you got there. And participated in the graduate program in the Memphis School of Preaching, 1998 to 2000. He's done mission work in the Philippines and Cambodia. Uh, he holds gospel meetings, speaks with several lectureships, conducted evangelistic campaigns in Oklahoma, Kansas, and Missouri, worked with several Bible youth camps, and served on the faculty of the Rose City Bible Learning Center in Little Rock, Arkansas. I mentioned he's also preached in England. Bruce has done local work in Kansas, Missouri, Arkansas, this has been working with the Fish Hatchery Road Church since 2001, where he also serves as one of the elders. He works for the Texas Department of Transportation, and we're grateful that he's here to speak to us on this timely topic, One Spirit, One Baptism. I count him a dear friend, a faithful fellow laborer in the kingdom as a gospel preacher, and we look forward to hearing what he has to say. You know, this topic, this theme is really timely and necessary. We have, over the past decade or more gone through a huge division among once sound brethren and the bible has a lot to say about unity and about fellowship and about faithfulness but it also has a lot to say about false teachers and false brethren we think about false brethren the bible talks about false prophets talks about wolves in sheep's clothing, sometimes refers to those as serpents, sometimes whited sepulchers, a whitewashed tomb. Outward they look good, but inwardly they're full of all manner of corruption. Paul talked about being in perils among false brethren. Peter talks about those that depart from the faith and going back to the world, that the latter end's worse than the beginning, and the Holy Spirit says they're no better than dirty pigs and vomit-eating dogs. Some try to hide their identity. They try to look like us and walk among us, try to be like us, but they have ulterior motives. They just want to sneak in like wolves in sheep's clothing, that have nothing to do and no better desire than to devour the flock. I'm thankful for this congregation. I'm thankful for this eldership, for David Brown himself, and the stand that they've taken consistently. I've known David since 1987. And David is the same man now, and he teaches the same thing now that he taught back then. And that's a good thing. I can't say that about other men that I've known through the years who were gospel preachers and elders. They're better described by those terms I just used. Not everybody is willing to stand up and defend the truth like this congregation has consistently done through the years through this lectureship, through the Contender for the Faith paper, through various other means that they reach out to those that are in error and try to, to stem the tide and turn back the tide. Very few, very few congregations could withstand what this congregation goes through on a regular basis and remain faithful and not compromise. And the reason that they do not 
compromise is because they are endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Notice the text says keep the unity of the spirit. It doesn't say go out and find it. It doesn't go out say go out and, and make it up. It says to keep it. That implies that unity existed in the first century and we as faithful Christians, it is incumbent upon us to keep it, to maintain it, to make sure that we don't lose it, that we don't compromise it. The word keep is a military term. In fact, a keep, in, in, if, you, if you know anything about castles, you have the outer wall, the inner wall, the, in, the, inner, the outer keep, and then the inner keep was a, a big tower in the middle of the castle, and that was your last line of defense. When we talk about keep the unity of the Spirit, we're talking about contending for the faith, standing up for the truth. We live in a time where we have modernism and pluralism and we have people that, that really don't believe that truth is out there. That there's anything that's absolute that we can hold on to and, and actually defend and believe in. But Paul, by inspiration, speaks narrowly of one. One, you know, when it says keep the inner spirit and the bond of peace, it says there is one and one and one, those seven ones. There is is in italics. It's not in the original text. When we think about the seven ones, and Jack touched upon this, we're talking about a unit. These things go together. They're inseparable. They stand or fall together. Jack was worried about only having two points in a three-point text. He said he only got to preach two-thirds of his text, and then he went ahead and preached the whole thing. And, you know, there's one baptism. That's, that was my topic. And I was going to approach it from, well, what is that one baptism? Well, Jack spoiled the ending. He already told you what the one baptism. You know, by the way, he had two points in the same verse. My points are from different verses. One spirit is in one verse and one baptism is in another verse. But you know what? Those two go together like hand in glove. One spirit and one baptism. Paul says to the Corinthians, by one spirit, you're all baptized into one body. Oh, wait a minute. There's that one body, right? See, you can't separate these things. You can't separate them. There are as many faiths and baptism as there are lords. I think somebody said that. They must have had my lesson, hacked my computer, and took my points and just incorporated it into my lesson. Or maybe it is the fact that we're all teaching out of the same book and we're more united than we think. Because if we have the unity of the Spirit and we're keeping it in the bond of peace the way we ought to, then we're all going to be teaching the same thing because we're all teaching out of the same book. And there's nothing new under the sun. In fact, if somebody gets up and starts teaching something that you've never heard before, that doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. But you better perk up and listen up and take notes and make sure that that new thing that you're hearing is according to the Scriptures. So when we think about this idea of one spirit and one baptism. We need to keep in mind that the world doesn't view the truth the way we do. And not only that, but this philosophical idea of truth and basically the lack of any substantive absolute truth has crept into the church. Now, you know, when I say that, 
I don't believe that everybody has embraced this idea of no absolute truth 100%. There's a lot of people that still believe that the Bible is inspired by God. They believe that it's the inerrant word of God. They believe that it is our authority. But they don't teach the whole counsel of God. And when that happens, they compromise the truth and we lose unity. And by the way, you know, we're talking about those wolves in sheep's clothing. There are some people that are so ashamed of their error that they want to attack those that teach the truth, but they don't have the backbone to do it to their face. And so they'll do something like uh, create a false email account or a false Facebook account and make up some fictitious name. And in that behind the scenes way will attack those that teach the truth and try to smear their good name. Now you know Judas was the most despicable person ever to live. But at least he had the backbone to do his deceit out in the open. Right? He was traitorous to the core. But when he betrayed Jesus, he looked him in the face. And betrayed him with a kiss. He didn't hide behind the scenes. No. But there are a lot of cowardly people out there. That want to compromise the truth. And that they want to hurt people that are standing up for the truth. So let's get into our lesson, enough soapbox. But we are in a battle, brethren. We are in a battle. We're all soldiers. And this isn't a battle we can afford to sit out on the sidelines and let somebody else fight. We need to be all in the battle. There's no pacifists in the army of Jesus Christ. We all are soldiers. We think about this idea of one spirit and one baptism. It comes up, how does one become a Christian? Now if you ask that in just in a general way to various people you might meet on the street, you may get a whole bunch of different answers. Right? I'm reminded of the Mississippi Squirrel Revival song by Ray Stevens where the squirrel gets loose at the first self-righteous Baptist church, right? And because of the squirrel running across people's legs and up their trousers and so forth, everybody gets excited and thinks, well, here's the Holy Spirit, right? So everybody starts confessing their sins. People volunteer to go out to the Congo and do mission work. And then he comes up, and one of the things that he says that resulted from that squirrel's revival was he said everybody got baptized whether they needed it or not. Well, that's the way some people look at baptism. Some people say, well, baptism is for remission of sin. Some people say it's not necessary to be saved. Some people say it's to join the, the church. And so there's all kinds of answers out there, right? In fact, you could be left with the impression that there's no really one single way to become a Christian. And there's that idea of pluralism we talked about. Truth is just whatever it is for you. And your truth is just as good as my truth. Some people might say, well, we're all just trying to get to heaven. We're just taking different roads. But there is only one way to God the Father, and that's through Jesus Christ. John chapter 14 and verse 6. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father but by me. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's pretty narrow, folks. That's why over here in Ephesians 4, we read about one Lord. That's why we read about one spirit, one faith, one baptism. One God, one hope. Because it's narrow. The truth is narrow. Consider Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 18. For through him, 
It's talking about Jesus. We have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now notice we have Jesus. We have access by one spirit to the Father. So we have the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lavelle. I don't have to go and teach that because he talked about the Godhead, didn't he? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. He talked about the transmission of the truth from the Father to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, to the apostles, and then down to us in the Bible. So I don't have to talk about that. Thank you very much. We have access to the Father through the Son. John 10 and verse 9. You know, Jesus talking about the good shepherd and the sheepfold. Well, Jesus says, I am the door. I am the way that you have access to the Father. And that door was opened by the sacrifice of Jesus. Hebrews 10, verses 19 and 20. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. The Holy Spirit is the agency that takes us through that doorway that was opened by Jesus. And that's the Holy Spirit. Now think about that. When I say the Holy Spirit's the agency that gets us through the door that was opened by Jesus, that takes some explaining, doesn't it? Because I don't want to go, let anybody go away thinking that I'm teaching a direct operation of the Holy Spirit because I am not. In fact, I'm teaching the very opposite of that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, turn there with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll look at verse 13. We mentioned this earlier, but I want to read it. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink of, into the one Spirit. Many say that this is talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and that's the way we enter into the church, into a right relationship with God. But when Paul said, by one Spirit, he did not mean Holy Spirit baptism. He's not saying that the Holy Spirit was the medium into which one is baptized. I remember I was having a Bible study with this young man, and Sue was supposed to be my silent partner. So you have, you have a team. You have one guy doing the teaching. And Sue's, Sue's my silent partner. Can you imagine Sue being silent? <laughs> silent partner. But that was her role. She's there. And the most of what she's supposed to do is help them find a verse in the Bible if they're having trouble, you know. And so I asked the guy, into what were you baptized, the Holy Spirit or water? And he said the Holy Spirit. And I thought Sue's teeth was going to fall out. So the cat's out of the bag, right? So that's the idea. Is it the, the medium into which we're baptized? Is it the Holy Spirit or is it water? Right? And Paul's not saying that the medium is the Holy Spirit here. He's saying the Holy Spirit is the agency. Now what do I mean by that? It makes a difference. It makes a big difference between whether the Holy Spirit is the medium or the agency that directed us to be baptized. So we're all baptized by one Spirit. We can settle the question by examining the conversions of the book of Acts and find out how that went. Now we're going to do two things in this part of the lesson. We're going to look at the Holy Spirit's role in conversion. And we're also going to look at the place of baptism in conversion. And what that baptism is. We're going to come back and talk more about baptism later. In Acts chapter 2 verse 36 through 41. And this was a passage that's always been one of my favorites. Come down here and, and Peter stands up with 11 inspired by the Holy Spirit. And he starts to address the people on the day of Pentecost. And he talks about Jesus. 
And he talks about the sacrifice. He talks about the resurrection. And then he comes down and he's trying to draw it all together and said, this same Jesus whom you crucified, God has made Lord in Christ. Wow. Can you imagine what's going through these people's minds? This is the man we had put to death. This is the man we had crucified. And this was the Savior. Can you imagine the despair, the hopelessness, when they were pricked in the heart and they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now, it may have been in their mind that they thought that hope was lost because we killed the Messiah, but they're not thinking about the resurrection, right? So Peter answered and said to them, repent ye and be baptized every one of you. Right? Remember, Peter is speaking by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Those are not the words of Peter. They're the words of the Holy Spirit who received them from Jesus, who received them from the Father. The Holy Spirit is united with the Father and with the Son. They're in agreement. In John 17, we had the lesson this morning about John 17 and that prayer of Jesus. And toward the end of that prayer, Jesus says, I pray not for these also only, not talking about the apostles now, not just them, but to all those that believe on me through their teaching. That's us. Jesus praying for us. That they may be one. Okay, what do you mean by one, Jesus? Jesus. That they might be one as I am in you and you are in me. We need to have the unity in the church that exists in the Godhead. Jesus said, I don't speak of myself. Whatever my Father says, that's what I speak. And when the Holy Spirit comes, He's not going to speak of Himself, but He's going to glorify me and whatever I reveal to Him, He's going to speak. And then here's Peter speaking by the Holy Spirit. There's how you have unity. That's how you have unity is through the teaching that's inspired by the Holy Spirit. We can't have it any other way. One of my favorite passages along this line, 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13. Paul said, I rejoice in the Lord that when you received our teaching, you received it not as the word of men, but as is in truth the word of God that effectually worketh in you that believe. You know that passage we're talking about back in Acts chapter 2, verse 40, with many other words, Jesus exhorted them, saying, Save yourself from this untoward generation. And they that gladly received the word were baptized. It was added unto them about 3,000 souls. Think about that. What was the Holy Spirit's part in that? The Holy Spirit supplied the Word by inspiration to Peter who transmitted it to those that were there on that occasion. They that gladly received it, responded to it, they obeyed it, they were baptized. Now was the Holy Spirit was the Holy Spirit the medium into which they were baptized? Were they baptized into the Holy Spirit or were they baptized in water? Or was the Holy Spirit the agency that told them what to do in order to be saved? You see, there's the Holy Spirit's job. There's the Holy Spirit's job. Acts chapter 8, verse 26 to 38. How did the Ethiopian eunuch learn how to be saved? Again, he was taught by Philip, who was inspired by the Holy Spirit. And Philip taught the exact same thing that Peter taught. That Peter and the eleven apostles taught on the day of Pentecost. You see, that Ethiopian was reading along, uh, riding along in his chariot reading Isaiah 53, and he was having trouble understanding whether Isaiah is talking about himself or some other man. 
It so happens he's talking about somebody else, right? We know he's talking about Jesus. And so Philip goes and joins himself to the chariot. He gets in there. He says, do you understand what you read? It's important, friends and brethren, that we understand what we read. That's why when, well, we push being a daily Bible reader there at Fish Hatchery, but I want people to be daily Bible students. We can read the Bible, but if we don't understand it, we're wasting our time. And so take notes. If you read something you don't understand, write it down. Chances are, in your further study, you may learn what that is. If not, there's nothing shameful about asking for help. So when Philip said, do you understand what you read? What did the Ethiopians say? How can I except some man show me? And he began at that scripture, Isaiah 53, and preached unto him Christ. Now, I know we've had people come along and for the sake of unity have said that we don't need to worry about the plan of salvation. We just need to teach the man, but not the plan. In other words, teach about Jesus, but don't teach the plan of salvation. And as long as they believe in Jesus, it's okay. But you know, on this occasion, when he's teaching the man, Jesus, the Ethiopian Ask a question. And according to my brethren that say preach the man and not the plan, this question would be out of place. Because they're going along, they come to a certain water, <coughs> and the Ethiopian said, see, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? Why would he ask that if he's preaching about Jesus? Because you cannot separate the plan from the man. If you're going to teach the man, you have to teach the plan. It goes hand in hand. So when Philip is beginning that same scripture, Isaiah 53, and he teaches about Jesus, that included baptism, didn't it? It included that one baptism. Now we're going to get an idea of what that one baptism is because once the, the, the answer was given. You have to believe. The confession was made. I believe that Jesus the Christ is the Son of God. They stopped the chariot. They reached under the seat, got the bottle of water out, and he sprinkled some water on him. Right? I actually had somebody explain it that way to me one time. That, you know, they were driving through a desert, and there's just no water out there, so it had to be a water bottle under the seat, and so he just poured some water out of the water bottle on him. But I don't know about you, but when it says that they stopped the chariot, they got off the chariot and got down into the water, and he baptized him, and then he came up out of the water, went on his way rejoicing, that tells me something. That it wasn't a water bottle. That there was at least a pool of water large enough for both men to go down into and for the Ethiopian to be immersed. Because that's the meaning of the word baptism. And notice the element here. Notice the medium is water, not the Holy Spirit. Not the Holy Spirit. What was the Holy Spirit's job? That was the agency by which Philip was inspired to tell this Ethiopian what he needed to do to be saved. And then by faith, Remember, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. By faith, the Ethiopian made that good confession and was obedient in baptism. And the reason he came up out of the water and went on his way rejoicing is because his sins were forgiven. Acts 2 and verse 38 says for that baptism is for in order to receive remission of sins. And I like that term remission. Remission is a wonderful word. It's a beautiful word. In fact, it reminds me when I was a kid, back, they don't use the word remit much anymore. But back in the day, you would get a bill, and it would say, here's your bill, $2. Please remit $2. And when you gave the $2, then they would write on there, remitted. Your debt's paid. So when we talk about remission of sin, Jesus Christ pays the debt. <clears throat> and he pays it with his blood, Acts 20 and verse 28. 
what Philip taught was the word of God, which came by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Second Peter chapter one, verse nineteen through twenty one. Remember what it says there. Holy men spake as God, or as they were rather moved by the Holy Spirit. That's how prophecy came in old time. Holy men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit. Just like Philip, just like Peter. Acts chapter 10, verse 34 through 48. We have Cornelius and his household who commanded, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Cornelius to be baptized in water. Well, it was Peter. Here's Peter again. Remember the situation. Here's the first Gentile converts. So Peter goes to them. He teaches them what they need to do. And while he's preaching, the Holy Spirit falls on Cornelius' house and his household. And they begin to speak in tongues. Now the purpose for this, the purpose for this was to indicate to the Jews, to Peter in particular, that God was accepting the Gentiles and offering them salvation through Christ. That's what that was for. But then Peter said, Who can forbid water that these should be baptized, seeing as they've received the same gift as we? Of course, rhetorical question. Nobody could forbid that they be baptized because God showed his approval by that very act. Similar to what happened to the apostles on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came down upon them in the form of those cloven tongues like as of fire. And they began to do what? Speak in tongues. Same similar thing happened to the household Cornelius to prove God's acceptance of them and Peter commanded them to be baptized. Remember, once again, Peter being guided by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit coming upon the household was not the baptism that was commanded. As a result, the Spirit's evidence of acceptance of his household. Therefore, the Holy Spirit was the agency that directed these people to be baptized in water by immersion for the remission of their sin. <clears throat> All who were baptized were led to do so by the teaching of God's word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. God's word came to men by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's written down for us in the New Testament today. The Old Testament also inspired, but we're under the New Testament. Remember, when we talk about one faith, it's not my topic, but when we talk about one faith, that's the New Testament for us today, not the Old Testament. That's not part of the faith under which we live today. There's no exception to this rule in the New Testament. They all came to God through Jesus Christ in the same way. Baptism in water was the medium into which people came in contact with the death and blood of Christ. And the Spirit was the agency by whom these people came to know they needed salvation. And the way to gain that salvation through obedience to the gospel faith in Jesus Christ, confession of his name, repentance of their sins, and being baptized in water by immersion for remission of sins. Look at John chapter 3 and verse 5. You know, Jesus, when Nicodemus came to him by night, Jesus said, except ye be born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Cornelius was a little bit confused. He thought Jesus was talking about what? Well, a new, not the new birth, but a rebirth. He asked, can a man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? See, Jesus talking about a spiritual birth. Cornelius is thinking about what? A physical birth. But Jesus talking about a new birth, a spiritual birth. We think about the Holy Spirit's part in that. Turn with me to James chapter 1. 
in James chapter 1, <clears throat> we read through several things. But then he comes down here. And in verse 16, he says, Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness no, nor shadow of turning. So when we think about the Holy Spirit and water. We have to be born again, born of spirit and water. What's the Holy Spirit's part in that? Well, we've already seen in all those conversions. His part is to supply the word. You know, if you're going to have a birth, you have to have a begettal and you have to have a coming forth. We are begotten, according to James, in verse 18, by God of his own will, begat he us with, get it now, the word of truth. How are we begotten? How are we born again? It takes that seed, Luke 8 and verse 11, which is the word of God, supplied by the Holy Spirit, planted in the hearts of good and honest people to take root and bear fruit. We're bought, begotten again by the word of God. That's how God brings about the conversion. But what about the coming forth? Well, in John chapter, or Romans rather, chapter 6, verses 3 through 6, where it talks about how we are Buried with Christ. We died to our sins. Just like Jesus died on the cross. And then we're buried with Jesus. Just like he was buried in the earth. But we're buried in water. That watery grave. Sometimes we call it the watery grave of baptism. And then what does it say? We're raised to walk in newness of life. See there's that new birth. There's that coming forth. Out of the watery grave of baptism. To walk in new life. Not to serve the old man of sin any longer because he's dead. Now our master is Jesus, the one Lord. Titus 3, verses 3 through 7. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness of the love of our Savior toward man appear. Not by works of righteousness we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now think about that. That's a big trans transition. And here in this verse, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all take part in our conversion from that old man of sin to that new creature in Christ Jesus. That's all brought about by the Holy Spirit directing the apostles and prophets of the first century to tell lost man what they must do in order to be saved. Are they, is the Holy Spirit involved in our conversion? Absolutely. Is he the agency in our conversion? Absolutely. He supplies the word, the message. My friends and brethren, the medium into which we are baptized is not the Holy Spirit. It is water, baptized in water, raised to walk in newness of life. I want to talk a little bit about how the Holy Spirit works. I mentioned earlier, I don't want you to think that I ever would teach the direct operation of the Holy Spirit, either in salvation or sanctification, or in any way to strengthen the Christian. There are some people, if you would, turn with me to Ephesians. <clears throat> Let's see the verse I'm looking for. Verse 16, Ephesians 3 and verse 16. Talking about God that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by the spirit in the inward man. Now here, here we have God. Paul's wanting God to strengthen the Christians in Ephesus. 
And he wants God to use the Holy Spirit to do that, to strengthen the inward man. Now, how is that going to happen? How is the Holy Spirit going to strengthen the inward man? Well, Paul said, by one spirit, we're all baptized into one body. How is the Holy Spirit working there? Remember, it's the same language. He wants to strengthen us by the Spirit, but it, Paul says we're baptized by the Spirit. How does that What was the Holy Spirit's work in baptism? Supplying the Word that, that, that taught those people what they needed to do in order to be saved based on their acceptance, their faith, their obedience. Their sins were washed away in baptism, Acts 22 and verse 16. They received remission of sin, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. And they were saved, Mark 16, verse 15. We think about this work of the Holy Spirit. We need to keep in mind Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17, where he's talking about putting on the whole armor of God. He talks about the helm of salvation, right? Have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel, and on and on that goes. But then toward the last, he says that we need to do what? Take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. The instrument through which the Holy Spirit works is the Word of God. It's just like if I go out and I take an axe and I chop down a tree. Did I chop down the tree? Did you say that I chopped down the tree? But I never touched it. The axe did the work. Right? The axe was my instrument. I never touched the tree, but my instrument did. When the Holy Spirit saves me and sanctifies me, He never does it directly, but He does it indirectly through His instrument, which is the sword of the Spirit, defined by Paul as the Word of God. That's how the Holy Spirit works that's how we're strengthened by the Holy Spirit in the inward man is through His Word. That's why I read earlier 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 13. The Word of God doesn't need any extra help from the Holy Spirit. We don't need to be worked on by the Holy Spirit so that we can understand the Word of God or be enlightened or illuminated in any way so that we can understand the Word of God or for the, whole, for the Word of God to work on us. The Word effectually works in us. It's effective. It doesn't need help from the Holy Spirit. Do you realize that those that teach that we need a direct operation of the Holy Spirit in order for the Word to be effective in our life deny the all-sufficiency of God's Word? It's exactly what they're doing. One other passage. Acts chapter 20 and verse 32. Paul's talking to the Ephesian elders. Probably the last time he's ever going to see them in this life. And he says, Now I commend you to God and the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you a home among them that are sanctified. You see, we don't need a direct operation of the Holy Spirit. We don't need anything else but the Word of God. Thank you for your time. And since David doesn't like me to say enjoy your freedom, I'll just say this. Enjoy the unity for which Jesus died. And let's work together to keep that unity and defend it against all that would try to destroy it. You ask Bruce why I pick at him about saying enjoy your freedom. It's not original with Bruce, is it? Oh, it's copyrighted by Matt That's all right. I still enjoy my freedom whenever I can get it. But I found out, as the old saying goes, freedom is really never free. I could say you live long and possible, but that's well, so much for all of that. I don't know. <laughs> Except we heard a great lesson. And I'm very appreciative of that. And, 
have watched Bruce over all these years. As I said earlier, I count him a dear friend, fellow laborer in Christ, and certainly appreciate that great message. The Word of God is quick and powerful, alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, fierce to give into the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And as a free moral agent, what more could God do to you than that without forcing you against your will? So Paul reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come as he preached to people whom God had empowered with reason. So we're happy to hear that good message. We'll stand adjourned for about 10 minutes at the bottom of the hour, and then we'll hear our last lesson of today. Thank you.